Chapter 6 of Memoirs of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Austen Lay. Chapter 6 Habits of Composition Resumed After a Long Interval. First Publication The Interest Taken by the Author in the Success of Her Works. Read by Chloe Winters, April 2008. It may seem extraordinary that Jane Austen should have written so little during the years that elapsed between leaving Steventon and settling at Chawton, especially when the cessation from work is contrasted with her literary activity, both before and after that period. It might rather have been expected that fresh scenes and new acquaintance would have called forth her powers while the quiet life which the family led both at Bath and Southampton must have afforded abundant leisure for composition. But so it was that nothing which I know of, certainly nothing which the public have seen, was completed in either of those places. I can only state the fact, without assigning any cause for it, but as soon as she was fixed in her second home, she resumed the habits of composition which had been formed in her first, and continued them to the end of her life." The first year of her residence at Chawton seems to have been devoted to revising and preparing for the press Sense and Sensibility and Pride and Prejudice, but between February 1811 and August 1816 she began and completed Mansfield Park, Emma, and Persuasion, so that the last five years of her life produced the same number of novels with those which had been written in her early youth. How she was able to effect all this is surprising, for she had no separate study to retire to and most of the work must have been done in the general sitting-room, subject to all kinds of casual interruptions. She was careful that her occupation should not be suspected by servants, or visitors, or any persons beyond her own family party. She wrote upon small sheets of paper which could easily be put away, or covered with a piece of blotting paper. There was, between the front door and the offices, a swing door which creaked when it was opened but she objected to having this little inconvenience remedied because it gave her notice when anyone was coming. She was not, however, troubled with companions like her own Mrs. Allen in Northanger Abbey, whose vacancy of mind and incapacity for thinking were such that, as she never talked a great deal, so she could never be entirely silent, and therefore while she sat at work, if she lost her needle, or broke her thread, or saw a speck of dirt on her gown, she must observe it, whether there were any one at leisure to answer her or not. In that well-occupied female party there must have been many precious hours of silence during which the pen was busy at the little mahogany writing-desk, while Fanny Price, or Emma Woodhouse, or Anne Elliot was growing into beauty and interest. I have no doubt that I and my sisters and cousins, in our visits to Chawton, frequently disturbed this mystic process, without having any idea of the mischief that we were doing. Certainly we never should have guessed it by any signs of impatience or irritability in the writer. As so much had been previously prepared, when once she began to publish, her works came out in quick succession. Sense and Sensibility was published in 1811, Pride and Prejudice at the beginning of 1813, Mansfield Park in 1814, Emma early in 1816, Northanger Abbey and Persuasion did not appear till after her death in 1818. It will be shown farther on why Northanger Abbey, though amongst the first written, was one of the last published. Her first three novels were published by Egerton, her last three by Murray. The profits of the four which had been printed before her death had not at that time amounted to seven hundred pounds. I have no record of the publication of Sense and Sensibility, nor of the author's feelings at this, her first appearance before the public, but the following extracts from three letters to her sister give a lively picture of the interest with which she watched the reception of Pride and Prejudice and show the carefulness with which she corrected her compositions and rejected much that had been written. Chawton, Friday, January ninth, 1813 I hope you received my little parcel by J. Bond on Wednesday evening, my dear Cassandra, and that you will be ready to hear from me again on Sunday, for I feel that I must write to you today. I want to tell you that I have got my own darling child from London. On Wednesday I received one copy sent down by Faulkner, with three lines from Henry to say that he had given another to Charles and sent a third by the coach to Godmersham. The advertisement is in our paper today for the first time. Eighteen shillings. He shall ask one pound one shilling for my two next, and one pound eight shillings for my stupidest of all. Miss B. dined with us on the very day of the book's coming, 
and in the evening we fairly sat at it, and read half the first volume to her, prefacing that, having intelligence from Henry that such a work would soon appear, we had desired him to send it whenever it came out, and I believe it passed with her unsuspected. She was amused, poor soul. That she could not help, you know, with two such people to lead the way, but she really does seem to admire Elizabeth. I must confess that I think her as delightful a creature as ever appeared in print, and how I shall be able to tolerate those who do not like her, at least I do not know. There are a few typical errors, and a said he or a said she would sometimes make the dialogue more immediately clear, but I do not write for such dull elves as have not a great deal of ingenuity themselves. The second volume is shorter than I could wish, but the difference is not so much in reality as in look, there being a larger proportion of narrative in that part. I have lopped and cropped so successfully, however, that I imagine it must be rather shorter than Sense and Sensibility altogether. Now I will try and write of something else. Chawton, Thursday, February 4, 1813 My dear Cassandra, your letter was truly welcome, and I am much obliged to you for all your praise. It came at a right time, for I had had some fits of disgust. Our second evening's reading to Miss B. had not pleased me so well, but I believe something must be attributed to my mother's too rapid way of getting on. Though she perfectly understands the characters herself, she cannot speak as they ought. Upon the whole, however, I am quite vain enough and well satisfied enough. The work is rather too light and bright and sparkling. It wants shade. It wants to be stretched out here and there with a long chapter of sense, if it could be had if not, of solemn specious nonsense, about something unconnected with the story, an essay on writing, a critique on Walter Scott, or the history of Bonaparte, or something that would form a contrast, and bring the reader with increased delight to the playfulness and epigrammatism of the general style. The greatest blunder in the printing that I have met with is in page 220, volume 3, where two speeches are made into one. There might as well be no suppers at Longbourn, but I suppose it was the remains of Mrs. Bennet's old merit and habits. The following letter seems to have been written soon after the last two, in February 1813. This will be a quick return for yours, my dear Cassandra. I doubt it's having much else to recommend it, but there is no saying. It may turn out to be a very long and delightful letter. I am exceedingly pleased that you can say what you do, after having gone through the whole work, and Fanny's praise is very gratifying. My hopes were tolerably strong of her, but nothing like a certainty. Her liking Darcy and Elizabeth is enough. She might hate all the others if she would. I have her opinion under her own hand this morning, but your transcript of it, which I read first, was not, and is not, the less acceptable. To me it is of course all praise, but the more exact truth which she sends you is good enough. Our party on Wednesday was not unagreeable, though we wanted a master of the house less anxious and fidgety, and more conversable. Upon Mrs. M's mention that she had sent the rejected addresses to Mrs. H, I began talking to her a little about them, and expressed my hope of their having amused her. Her answer was, Oh dear, yes, very much, very droll indeed, the opening of the house and the striking up of the fiddles. What she meant, poor woman, who shall say? I sought no farther. As soon as a whist party was formed and a round table threatened, I made my mother an excuse and came away, leaving just as many for their round table as there were at Mrs. Grant's. I wish they might be as agreeable a set. My mother is very well, and finds great amusement in glove knitting, and at present wants no other work. We quite run over with books. She has got Sir John Carr's Travels in Spain, and I am reading a Society Octavo, an essay on the military police and institutions of the British Empire, by Captain Pasley of the Engineers, a book which I protested against at first, but which, upon trial, I find delightfully written and highly entertaining. I am as much in love with the author as I ever was with Clarkson or Buchanan, or even the two Mr. Smiths of the city, the first soldier I ever sighed for, but he does write with extraordinary force and spirit. Yesterday, moreover, brought us Mrs. Grant's letters, with Mr. White's compliments, but I have disposed of them, compliments and all, to Miss P., and amongst so many readers or retainers of the books as we have in Chawton, I dare say there will be no difficulty in getting rid of them for another fortnight, if necessary. I have disposed of Mrs. Grant for the second fortnight to Mrs. M. It can make no difference to her which of the twenty-six fortnights in the year the three volumes lie on her table. I have been applied to for information as to the oath taken in former times of bell, book, and candle, but have none to give. 
perhaps you may be able to learn something of its origin where you now are. Ladies who read those enormous, great, stupid, thick quarter volumes, which one always sees in the breakfast parlour there, must be acquainted with everything in the world. I detest a quarto. Captain Pasley's book is too good for their society. They will not understand a man who condenses his thoughts into an octavo. I have learned from Sir J. Carr that there is no government house at Gibraltar. I must alter it to the commissioners. The following letter belongs to the same year, but treats of a different subject. It describes a journey from Chawton to London in her brother's curricle, and shows how much could be seen and enjoyed in course of a long summer's day by leisurely travelling amongst scenery, which the traveller in an express train now rushes through in little more than an hour, but scarcely sees at all. Sloane Street, Thursday, May 20, 1813. My dear Cassandra, before I say anything else, I claim a paper full of halfpence on the drawing-room mantelpiece. I put them there myself, and forgot to bring them with me. I cannot say that I have yet been in any distress for money, but I choose to have my due as well as the devil. How lucky we were in our weather yesterday! This wet morning makes one more sensible of it. We had no rain of any consequence. The head of the curricle was put half up three or four times, but our share of the showers was very trifling though they seemed to be heavy all round us when we were on the hog's back, and I fancied it might then be raining so hard at Chawton as to make you feel for us much more than we deserved. Three hours and a quarter took us to Goldfoot, where we stayed barely two hours and had only just time enough for all we had to do there, that is, eating a long and comfortable breakfast, watching the carriages, paying Mr. Harrington, and taking a little stroll afterwards. From some views which that stroll gave us, I think most highly of the situation of Guildford. We wanted all our brothers and sisters to be standing with us in the bowling green, and looking towards Horsham. I was very lucky in my gloves, got them at the first shop I went to, though I went into it rather because it was near than because it looked at all like a glove shop, and gave only four shillings for them, after which everybody at Chawton will be hoping and predicting that they cannot be good for anything, and their worth certainly remains to be proved. But I think they look very well. We left Guildford at twenty minutes before twelve, I hope somebody cares for these minutiae, and were at Esher in about two hours more. I was very much pleased with the country in general, between Guildford and Ripley I thought it particularly pretty, also about Paynes Hill, and from a Mr. Spicer's grounds at Esher, which we walked into before dinner, the views were beautiful. I cannot say what we did not see, but I should think there could not be a wood, or a meadow, or palace, or remarkable spot in England that was not spread out before us on one side or another. Claremont is going to be sold. A Mr. Ellis has it now. It is a house that seems never to have prospered. After dinner we walked forward to be overtaken at the coachman's time, and before he did overtake us we were very near Kingston. I fancy it was about half-past six when we reached this house a twelve hours' business, and the horses did not appear more than reasonably tired. I was very tired too, and glad to get to bed early, but am quite well today. I am very snug in the front drawing-room all to myself, and would not say thank you for any company but you. The quietness of it does me good. I have contrived to pay my two visits, though the weather made me a great while about it, and left me only a few minutes to sit with Charlotte Craven. She looks very well, and her hair is done up with an elegance to do credit to her education. Her manners are as unaffected and pleasing as ever. She had heard from her mother today. Mrs. Craven spends another fortnight at Chilton. I saw nobody but Charlotte, which pleased me best. I was shown upstairs into a drawing-room where she came to me, and the appearance of the room, so totally unschool-like, amused me very much. It was full of modern elegancies. Yours very affectionately, J. A. The next letter, written in the following year, contains an account of another journey to London, with her brother Henry, and reading with him the manuscript of Mansfield Park. Henrietta Street, Wednesday, March 2, 1814 My dear Cassandra, you were wrong in thinking of us at Guildford last night. We were at Cobham. On reaching G, we found that John and the horses were gone on. We therefore did no more than we had done at Farnham sit in the carriage while fresh horses were put in, and proceeded directly to Cobham, which we reached by seven, and about eight were sitting down to a very nice roast fowl. We had altogether a very good journey, and everything at Cobham was comfortable. I could not pay Mr. Harrington. That was the only alas of the business. I shall therefore return his bill and my mother's to L, that you may try your luck. 
we did not begin reading till Bentley Green. Henry's approbation is hitherto even equal to my wishes. He says it is different from the other two, but does not appear to think it at all inferior. He has only married Mrs. R. I am afraid he has gone through the most entertaining part. He took to Lady B. and Mrs. N. most kindly, and gives great praise to the drawing of the characters. He understands them all, likes Fanny, and, I think, foresees how it will all be. I finished the heroine last night, and was very much amused by it. I wonder James did not like it better. It diverted me exceedingly. We went to bed at ten. I was very tired, but slept to a miracle, and am lovely to-day, and at present Henry seems to have no complaint. We left Cobham at half-past eight, stopped to bait and breakfast at Kingston, and were in this house considerably before two. Nice, smiling Mr. Barlow met us at the door and, in reply to inquiries after news, said that peace was generally expected. I have taken possession of my bedroom, unpacked my bandbox, sent Miss P's two letters to the two-penny post, been visited by Mr. B, and am now writing by myself at the new table in the front room. It is snowing. We had some snowstorms yesterday, and a smart frost at night, which gave us a hard road from Cobham to Kingston, but as it was then getting dirty and heavy, Henry had a pair of leaders put on to the bottom of Sloane Street. His own horses, therefore, cannot have had hard work. I watched for veils as we drove through the streets, and had the pleasure of seeing several upon vulgar heads. And now, how do you all do, you in particular? After the worry of yesterday and the day before, I hope Martha had a pleasant visit again, and that you and my mother could eat your beef pudding. Depend upon my thinking of the chimney-sweeper as soon as I wake to-morrow. Places are secured at Drury Lane for Saturday, but so great is the rage for seeing Keene that only a third and fourth row could be got. As it is in a front box, however, I hope we shall do pretty well. Shylock, a good play for Fanny. She cannot be much affected, I think. Mrs. Perrigan has just been there. She tells me that we owe her master for the silk dyeing. My poor muslin has never been dyed yet. It has been promised to be done several times. What wicked people dyers are! They begin with dipping their own souls in scarlet sin. It is evening. We have drank tea and have torn through the third volume of the heroine. I do not think it falls off. It is a delightful burlesque, particularly on the Radcliffe style. Henry is going on with Mansfield Park. He admires H. Crawford. I mean, properly, as a clever, pleasant man. I tell you all the good I can, as I know how much you will enjoy it. We hear that Mr. Keene is more admired than ever. There are no good places to be got in Drury Lane for the next fortnight, but Henry means to secure some for Saturday fortnight, when you are reckoned upon. Give my love to little Cass. I hope she found my bed comfortable last night. I have seen nobody in London yet with such a long chin as Dr. Syntax, nor anybody quite so large as Gog McCollicus. Yours affectly, J. Austin. End of chapter 6. Recorded by Chloe Winters, April 2008.